thank you, Brooklyn, for accepting our invite to speak at this conference at such a short notice. Brooklyn is the uh, co-founder and CTO of a company called uh, Fission uh, Code. Uh, they, this, this is a company where they are building the next generation web dev tools. Uh, you know, uh, like some interesting stuff. I was looking at their website in terms of how you can really leverage edge computing, uh, you know, for your web applications and stuff like that. I think uh, uh, she also founded, we were just talking about how she started the Vancouver's uh, function programming community where uh, she, so she's joining us today from Vancouver, Canada, the West Coast, uh, pretty early for her. <laughs> so again, appreciate her waking up early for doing this talk. But she started the Vancouver Functional Programming Committee, uh, Community, uh, the meetup over there. Uh, she's also an author to uh, several Elixir libraries. Uh, some of you might recognize her work from Witchcraft and Exceptional. Uh, she's certainly uh, a big proponent of the Web3, uh, having contributed to uh, several standards, uh, web native file system, one of them at least that I can know of. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a real honor to have someone uh, like Brooklyn with us who's done so much for the Alexia community in general for the functional programming community, and now for the web three uh, space as well. So uh, I think, and again, her topic is something that a lot of you would really enjoy. Uh, it's called uh, Beam to the uh, Future, uh, Old Ideas Made New, uh, some, you know, very important things I think uh, that I'm looking forward to. So. I think without much delay, thanks again, Brooklyn, and over to you. Uh, thanks for the intro. And yeah, so let's get started with Beam to the Future, Old Ideas Made New. Uh, this is the 2022 edition. So uh, again, this is um, uh, I was, uh, um, asked to fill in after another speaker um, uh, wasn't able to make it. Um, and so I'm giving a reprise of a talk I gave in uh, 2020 in San Francisco, uh, literally days before everything shut down from the pandemic, um, you know, literally wondering like, will I be able to get on a flight back home? And so here I am bookending it again on the other side now, um, you know, things are slowly starting to open up. Uh, and so here we are um, in 2022. Um, I tend to start uh, every section uh, of, of uh, talks, and this is no exception to that, um, uh, with uh, a sort of uh, orienting quote. Um, and so the theme for this entire talk is that in order for us to keep moving forward, sometimes we have to look back at uh, older ideas, ideas that maybe didn't make it through the whole evolutionary process because the context was different. And maybe, um, uh, or maybe it was just purely by chance we took you know, this path instead of that path. Um, so we need to take a look back and look around to make sure that we're on going in the right direction. Um, and there's quite a few of these uh, programs from, uh, from Perlis uh, as well. Um, uh, so many good ideas are never heard from again. So, um, uh, uh, I, I just got a very lovely introduction, but I'll uh, uh, give the, the quick run through here again. So my name is Brooklyn Zelenka. I'm everywhere on the internet as Xpeed. I'm the CTO at Fission, uh, where we're working on the next generation, sometimes called post serverless or edge apps. Uh, and our goal, which will not make me very popular in this, this room, I'm sure, uh, is to make backends and DevOps completely obsolete. Um, the good news is it's still very early technology, so your jobs are safe for now. Um, my background is in programming language theory, uh, virtual machines, and distributed systems. Uh, I do a bunch of standards work as well, um, with the Decentralized Identity Foundation, um, UCAN, so distributed auth uh, working group, uh, Ethereum. I was an Ethereum core developer, maybe focused on the virtual machine for, uh, for a couple of years, um, multi formats, a few others. Um, I founded Vancouver Functional Programming Meetup and then Beam, uh, and yes, and mostly known in this community for uh, Witchcraft, uh, LG, uh, Quark, and a few others that bring ideas from Haskell into Elixir, um, as well as Exceptional, a few others. So, Exceptional is an error handling library that makes it slightly easier to work with errors and with more context than the with syntax. So, uh, this is a uh, talk about uh, the past. And yet we're talking about uh, this, the theme of this conference, right, is the future of Erlang and Elixir. So um, why, uh, why look at the past? Why, why look at different things? Well, uh, I don't believe that this is the, the current state of the beam is the end all and be all of how uh, programming works, right? It's, it's uh, it, uh, if we're going to 
continue to make progress, right? And you know, ship new new versions and add new features and uh, be more productive. We need to look around and find new ideas, which is a little bit difficult, right? Because the beam does so much right. Everybody else right now is looking at us as like, well, the actors seem actually pretty great. Um, maybe we should do that too. Um, you know, as a, a side note, we're, we're exploring actors uh, inside of Wasm uh, at Vision currently because it's just like such a great um, uh, uh, model for doing concurrency, um, which is so important uh, these days. So um, the, the core question, right, is how do we move forward as an ecosystem cross language, cross paradigm, right? This isn't just Erlang and Elixir, this is the beam. We have lots, lots of different languages. We have you know, Alpaca and Erlog and LFE and a whole bunch of others, right? And so uh, if we don't know what the design space is, it's gonna be pretty difficult for us to, um, uh, uh, to make progress. The other uh, thing that we have to keep in mind, anytime you're designing anything, right? You're kind of, you're, you have a theory, you have a starting point, and then you're doing a breadth of research in the design space. Um, and it's really easy to get trapped in a local maxima, right? So, uh, you know, we've gotten to this, this point and all of the directions around us seem, uh, seem worse, right? But we actually want to find even better things. And sometimes to get there, you have to go through the rough, uh, uh, unpleasant portions that uh, may, maybe aren't as, as good ideas or didn't, uh, didn't survive for some, some reason. Um, and uh, in integrating them won't be as polished until you make it all the way up to the top of the next peak. So spoiler alerts, um, in, in broad strokes, we're gonna talk about three, three main things, breaking out of linear thinking and the, the general uh, von Neumann computation, um, type, new types of modularity for the beam, ideas that are literally decades old, but that uh, we haven't really uh, seen so much in, in this ecosystem. Uh, and composable languages. So in the beginning, um, a lot of other projects can take a really, really long time uh, to complete, right? So uh, uh, Perlis here uh, mentions, you know, cathedrals can take a century to complete. Uh, we haven't even been programming for a century, right? Uh, imagine a programming project that, that took a hundred years and, you know, hundreds or thousands of people to, to complete. Um, other than the fact that we have things like open source where the you know, total number of aggregate hours in parallel is very high. Um, uh, um, just imagine where we're gonna go with this in two, 300 years. Okay. So it, it's really the beginning of programming, obviously, right? Um, and you know we have to take an arbitrary point. The, the, one of the earliest things that looks even remotely like programming to us is uh, Fortran, um, and of course that was uh, you know in the era of punch cards. And to give us a sense of era, um, Elvis was uh, on the radio at the time, right? Like uh, Elvis was the, the the literally hip cool cool new guy. Um, Erling shows up about twenty nine years later. Okay. Um, the actual machines now look more like uh, what we would recognize, you know, uh, some, some Apple computers, um, music also a lot more modern, right? Everybody listening to Madonna. Um, a little later, uh, later that year, um, I'm born. Uh, so, and not to make uh, people who are around feel old, but just like give you a sense of time scale that we're talking about here, right? We're not talking, you know, uh, what's the latest release of a version? It's over the course of decades because here we are, you know, 35, 36 years later at this event. Um, a computing device literally fits in your pocket. Um, and uh, we've had enough time since Erlang was created that uh, I've completely lost touch. And uh, uh, Glass Animals is uh, the, the big uh, new thing, number one on the billboard this week. Uh, and I've literally never heard of them. So uh, just again, to give you a sense of scale that we're talking about here. So uh, paradigms uh, and the, the shift between them. Um, Douglas Rockford, who's somebody, uh, a, you know, a figure in the JS community, says that it's really difficult to distinguish a new paradigm from a really bad idea because the shiny new object is part of the old paradigm. Um, and I think this extends to all uh, facets and all aspects of programming, right? So a lot of people uh, entered um, uh, Elixir because they were in Ruby, um, but it's actually, a, a, you know, um, uh, uh, 
a bit of a bait and switch, right? Because Elixir is definitely not Ruby, right? It's very, very different. Um, uh, and for so long, people were just trying to find like, well, what's the, the newest, you know, object-oriented uh, language? It's like, well, let's give you something simple, you know, uh, just syntax to bring you in. And now you have a better way of working. And it's just a very new paradigm. Um, we've also been building, you know, with this idea of slowly uh, um, trying to maintain the same paradigm, we've been building lab style apps for 30 years, give or take. Um, so that's, you know, having a web server, um, a database, and, um, uh, uh, you know, sitting on a Linux box somewhere. And we're at the point now where we're saying, well, we need to have a higher degree of parallelism. We need to be able to auto scale all the stuff. So we're gonna use containers, um, which is uh, uh, really taking this idea of like, well, we don't wanna change anything, right? Uh, the, the fundamental architecture needs to stay the same. So we're gonna you know, really extend this as, as far as possible. Um, and uh, then we'll just ship your machine to the cloud. Right. Um, and what happens then is you've taken uh, some of this complexity and you've said, well, it's uh, uh, actually handling the scaling and all of these things is somebody else's problem, right? We haven't actually gotten rid of it. It's somebody else's problem. I still have to deal with this towering stack of technologies. We still have to train people on all of these things. Um, uh, we haven't actually simplified the picture at all, right? We're just trying to do the same thing, but in more contexts. Um, Larry Tesler, uh, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago, um, who had a huge impact on the, on the industry. I'm not sure if you've ever used copy and paste, but he invented it, um, has this idea, Tesler's law, uh, every application has an inherent amount of complexity that can't be removed, only moved around. Um, so you can reduce things up until a certain point, and then it becomes, you know, it's either the programmer's problem or it's the... Um, you can add it to the user, or you can bake it right into um, into a framework or a language, but you can't actually get rid of it. You can just move it from place to place, right? So you can either re-architect how apps work, or you can stick them in containers and make it ops problem. So with that in mind, um, you know, and with uh, th this history of we're just trying to do the same things, uh, you know, and the same general picture for now uh, 30 years, what if there were some different um, uh, uh, paths that we took down this, this breadth for search in the design space? We're gonna look at a few of them today. Uh, we're gonna look at briefly at array-based languages, uh, the applicative model, uh, the standard ML module system, um, it's actually in a few others, but that's, that's where it's mostly known from, uh, and uh, natural and business languages. Um, because if we had gone through and just cut a few parts of this tree, the world would look very different today. I'm not saying necessarily better, right? It would just be different. So let's start with something um, that normally when I give these talks is actually quite alien, but uh, I was uh, informed that there's a, a large contingent uh, at, at this conference uh, for, for this. Um, so uh, this uh, is a relatively famous program. It's a one-liner that does quite a lot. It's written in APL, which is um, uh, normally when I give these talks and I ask, you know, who here knows APL, I see, you know, like four hands go up, right? Um, I guess there's a big APL section at Functional Comp, which is amazing. I think it's a really lovely language. Um, and this is the uh, Conway's game of life, right? Uh, which, which is this. Uh, all it knows is that there's a grid, every dot, uh, on it is if it's, um, you know, a white dot, there's nothing there, if it's a black dot, then it's alive. Um, and then it has some basic rules about, well, depending on what's in this neighborhood, it should either reproduce uh, or stay still or die. And you get all of this emergent behavior from it, right? From, from literally this one line, one line of code that normally in say, uh, in Elixir would take, uh, you know, a couple of dozen lines uh, at, at minimum to, to do. Um, and why is it so compact? Well, um, uh, Iverson, the, um, uh, the creator of, of APL, has uh, actually a really uh, uh, lovely uh, Turing word lecture and papers and whatnot on how the, the syntax and the, uh, the entire orientation of the language is around arrays, and it makes things very pithy, very easy to express in short sentences, especially if you're doing things on matrices, which, you know what, a lot of computing is. Right. So how does this relate to, um, to Elixir? Well, we often hear that uh, actors are also uh, very simple, small building blocks, right, that we're going to build up from. 
Um, but the, the problem with actors is that reasoning about dynamic organisms can actually be really hard, right? Um, yeah, you know, it's just a bunch of, you know, chemical reactions. But it's actually, you know, there's an entire field it's called biology, right? That that is about uh, how organisms work. There's many fields actually that that come out of this, right? We get emergent behavior, which sometimes we want, sometimes we don't. And people, you know, I sometimes hear lately for some reason people saying that ah, you know, uh, uh, composition is great because it gets rid of emergent behavior. Uh, it does not. You get emergent behavior all over the place. Um, I, and even if it's understood and known, right? Like if you're putting some simple things together, sometimes stuff um, that you didn't expect to happen will happen. You need, when you're looking at a system like this, you need to be running a simulation in your head of everything that's going to happen so that you can even get up into a level of abstraction above this, uh, which is a lot of cognitive load. And yeah, we can abstract away some of this, right? We have things like Broadway, um, in Elixir, uh, a lot of other languages have things like arrows, um, but that's not, this level, right? That's trying to abstract up and away from it. So uh, what's the, um, the advantage of doing things in arrays? Well, it means that we have these shared nothing architectures. Um, and when you share nothing, you get better performance um, because a performance drops off when you um, have data contention. So um, some people have seen this <clears throat> diagram before. This is as we add more uh, processors, more parallelism, uh, what's the performance gain that we get? And Amdahl's law, uh, you know, very famously says that uh, you don't get a uh, perfectly linear, you know, this red line, uh, you know, 45 degree angle. You get this purple line uh, where, you know, you have some 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 drop off. Um, the actual law that we see in practice is the universal scaling law. It says, well, here's our incoherence or our data contention penalty. So if I have to wait for data or I'm getting some data that's out of sequence and I don't know how to handle that, or even if I can handle that, I have to do the reconciliation. Um, when we put in too much parallelism, we actually lose um, performance. So there's a, this sweet spot, this, this top of the curve. Um, and this is directly related to how much uh, um, does the data relate to each other? So if we're just mapping over an array or over a list, um, we actually get a really nice straight line except for the overhead of um, actually spawning those processes. Uh, and so this is exactly that. This is a, a line from Witchcraft. This is async map. You'll notice that it looks a whole lot like enum.map, right? Um, and in this one, we can do, you know, just as a, a a uh, simple example, right? We can sleep the process for 500 milliseconds um, and then, uh, you know, actually do, do some computation. Um, and we can do a huge list of these, right? In under a second, we have a, a bunch of benchmarks in uh, Witchcraft that are not surprising, right? Where if you run enum.map over some things, um, it takes literally minutes. Uh, and here it's like, you know, essentially instant. This works because we have a shared nothing architecture because lists essentially are. Um, like an array where nothing depends on each other, each other, right? This is great for embarrassingly parallel problems, really big things that break up nicely on a grid. Um, you can do a lot with this in macros uh, and do analysis at compile time. You could do um, uh, um, figuring out based on the size of the input, you know, should this be run sequentially or in parallel? Um, uh, you know, uh, analyze, should you be chunking it? All of this stuff without having to think about, well, what's the exact data flow through the program, right? Just literally saying async map and you're done. Um, when people want granular control, you trade off something, right? It's going back to Tester's law, right? You make it harder to reason about. Um, and uh, if you have something like impurity, right? We're functional programmers. And since you have impurity, it's also harder to reason about because now part of things are outside of your system and out of your control, right? <clears throat> So extending this idea a little bit further, what if we have table-oriented programming, right? So it just happens to have the same letters as OTP, um, so T-O-P, top. So we want to express something like this, right? So here's a table. It has name, uh, username, and city, right? Just a few of the folks I work with. Um, here's a schema that we can represent that with. It's sort of the naive view. Uh, and this might be some of the, um, the, the data that we have. Right? So it's just, just a list um, uh, of structs. And that works, but it, it might not be uh, particularly um, uh, efficient, or even if we want to say grab columns, it might be difficult to grab uh, that data because we're gonna have to iterate over absolutely everything. But what we do get 
is because the data on each of these records doesn't depend on each other. Again, we can do things like, well, what if I want to run multiple computations over this, right? And I can have several functions in an array that I'm passing through this data, right? Um, if we have zero dependencies, because we know that this lives in a grid, right? And so, you know, each of these data uh, bits of data might be just a, sing a single field, right? Uh, if you're familiar with data log, um, uh, or triple stores, this is essentially what's happening, right? And you can run these multiple functions over it. Um, then you can do that literally, you know, sliced any, any which way you like. So what does that actually look like? Well, this is again from Witchcraft. Um, here we're taking uh, addition and multiplication and then providing to them uh, as first arguments, one, two, and three, and as second arguments, four, five, and six. So I'm gonna add one and four, two and four, three and four, you know, multiply one and four, two and four, and three and four, and so on. And uh, with some uh, nice use of uh, new lines, you can then get this nice grid at the end showing, you know, here's the, um, the matrix that we get back out of running multiple computations uh, over the same data. The other way of looking at this is as if you have ecto everywhere, right? So uh, relational algebra is super powerful, very well understood. Um, and uh, a lot of ideas from databases uh, turn out to be extremely useful uh, to general computation, right? So software transactional memory, the ability to roll back uh, changes if you crash in the middle of it or you have a, a broken expectation or somebody else you know, wrote that variable. Um, uh, Ecto is super powerful for talking about data um, and doing transformations on data and checking data. What if we just added Ecto to everything, right? What if we extended this more out into the, the rest of programming and to the rest of the language? So let's talk about composition and modularity. Uh, symmetry is a complexity reducing concept. Seek it everywhere. And you can't communicate complexity itself, only that you're aware of it. So what do we even mean by composition? We're functional programmers, obviously you know what composition means, right? Um, so it breaks up into a few uh, categories, right? So we have things like higher order functions and we don't actually have composition uh, in uh, Elixir at all, but we do have function application, which is, uh, uh, which is equivalent, right? It, as soon as you add abstraction. And these are kinds of modularity, right? Um, we also have rules, things like commutativity or associativity um, uh, that mean that, you know, the order that we do things in, if I do B and then A or A and then B, they're equivalent, right? Um, and so that gives us another kind of orthogonality. So the ability to say that all of these different things are symmetric, right? Um, uh, I've pulled out a higher order function or I have the ability to, to change the order of my, uh, of my arguments or, or my applications. So let's look at composition in a couple of different dimensions. Composition in the data dimension, pretty straightforward, right? These are structs. This is a tree. Uh, we've composed some data together, huzzah, right? Uh, in the function dimension, this is what we're usually familiar with, right? So I'm gonna take some data, I'm gonna run it through F, and then later I'm gonna run it through G. It's still this the same sort of general picture, right? Where we have these boxes and the arrows, but now our boxes are functions instead of data. We can also, in this model, turn this into data flow and say, I'm going to fork out my data across multiple streams or then merge them again uh, together later. And we'll look at that uh, in, in a couple of slides as a, a concrete example as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, composition of capabilities, things like protocols and higher order functions, where we say, um, you know, functions are just data with a hole in them, and we need to complete uh, complete that hole by adding in some last little bit of context, right? Um, even seeing things like map or reduce as uh, evalu general evaluation strategies that you're then going to say, well, this is how to complete that function. Here's how to complete the strategy. I want you to add one to everything in the, the whatever the structure is I'm going to get back. Um, in Elixir, everything uh, in Enum works on lists, but there, there's nothing saying that it has to be that. You, know, you can absolutely uh, write functions like again, in, in witchcraft uh, functors, where we maintain the structure uh, of the data when you do a map. And so you'll get back the same shape uh, of, say, a binary tree. Okay. 
And finally, um, uh, and this one, I, I, uh, when I was going back through this, I was like, oh yeah, musical, <laughs> actually a lot of this one lately, um, is execution symmetry. So program can be developed on a sequential platform. And even if it's meant to be run on a parallel platform, as long as we're aware of the properties it has, right? So if we have uh, ideas like um, uh, associativity uh, or uh, commutativity, then it doesn't matter the order in which we do things. And so actually having a sequential program is perfectly fine and a valid interpretation um, uh, of that program. So it makes it much easier to test. So as a picture, just time moving in the downward direction and we have some events, um, you know, we have one and then we fork process and there's these two that happen and then the blue one on, on the right. Um, and this blue, you know, is going to happen sometime in the middle here, which means that we have a bunch of different uh, timelines, a bunch of different executions that are actually equivalent, right? Like all three of these straight lines um, are uh, valid interpretations of this graph, right? The uh, the major difference is, uh, you know, blue can move around anywhere in here as long as it's between the beginning and end nodes, um, and as long as this uh, orange comes before the pink node. Um, then we can put them in any, you know, move them around uh, however we want. We can take advantage of this in things like explicit data flow. So this is a similar picture, except time's going to move uh, just to make everything fit, uh, so from top to bottom, from left to right. Um, and what does this actually look like in code, right? So we're going to have some, you know, moving along, and then we're going to split and have different tracks for the data, and then you'll bring them together. Um, here's some actual concrete code that does this. Um, and I've now uh, color coded it so you, you can see it's even almost, again, if, if you play around with the, the white space and the new lines, you can almost lay it out uh, similar to the, the actual picture. And so now we have this higher level of, of abstraction, this picture, and humans are very good at dealing in pictures of doing data flow, right? How modular are our modules and libraries, right? Which feels like a really meta, meta question. Um, higher order modules uh, are a concept that's been around for a couple decades, like literally 30, 40 years, but just haven't really made it into the mainstream uh, as much. Um, so a uh, quick story, uh, I was at a consultancy many years ago now, uh, and uh, uh, we'd handed out subcontracted to another company to do um, uh, the majority of the web development portion of a project, and it was their first uh, Phoenix app that they had ever written. Um, and, you know, we're kind of getting close to the deadline, uh, and it's just not ready. Uh, so it gets handed back off to us. We have about 10 days to finish, and we go, well, how do we finish this thing fast enough? And thought, well, yeah, actually, this is a pretty straightforward uh, CRUD app. What if we wrote some macros that would generate everything, um, the ecto schema, the types, the, uh, the controller, the templates, everything, right? And then be able to override uh, individual functions um, uh, so that we wouldn't get the default one from the macro um, uh, if, if we had provided it. And we needed the ability to um, uh, swap in different, for example, backends or different queries, um, depending on the context that it's going to run in. So we created these higher order modules. Here's the, uh, the modules spec, right? Uh, where we pass in arguments to the module itself, which then uh, can get, as long as it has a, a using clause, we can do all of that construction um, and imports uh, directly there. Right, so this is in the same way that you have a higher order function um, or a, a, a protocol or a behavior, right? Um, this is passing in arguments to the module itself to say, hey, this is how you're going to construct yourself. Here's the dependencies you can pass in. And this also then gives you a uh, hot swappable dependencies at runtime, not just at compile time, right? So it makes it very modular. You don't have to fork a project now if you want to have a different dependency, you want a different JSON renderer. You just pass it into the module and everything works. Right. So uh, how do we even extend the module system uh, in Elixir? And, you know, uh, shocker, it all comes back to macros again. So this is from uh, type class, which is part of the witchcraft suite, um, where we do things like um, 
uh, we extend protocols so that uh, we make sure oh, you want to do a, a protocol uh, X, well, you need to have protocol Y already implemented. Otherwise, we're going to fail to compile because this is part of the guarantee of the system. Uh, so if you want to have a, you know, the, the dreaded monad, then you need to have a functure, for example, um, and it'll do that checking at compile time. And it's actually, it's not that, that much code. It's like 60 lines of code. Uh, and we can do all of this checking um, because macros aren't, um, you know, just for metaprogramming, they are compile time functions. And so you can do it for literally anything happening at compile time. So higher order modules love behaviors, right? Because what we're saying is this module implements this interface. So you, when you pass that in, as long as you can say, well, whatever my interface was right back here, I have a query mod and schema mod. Well, then I can call functions on them, right? So it's this, again, it's, it feels like a really nice uh, overlap with uh, where the, the beam is and beam languages are, but we just haven't really used them, right? And finally, last section, uh, declarative embedded DSLs. Um, I have regarded it as the highest goal of programming language design to enable good ideas to be elegantly expressed. And I could not agree more, right? The, the limits of your language limit what you can think about. Um, and, uh, you know, having expressive languages is why we're interested in functional programming in the first place, right? And there's an argument that absolutely everything is a DSL, right? Uh, to some degree, and I, I, would, I would actually agree. You know, um, even um, you know, assembly language is a DSL for programming, specific, spe you know, specialized hardware, right? Um, your uh, uh, your applications are DSLs for end users that are very narrow and very specific and extremely powerful, right? And there's this always this trade-off between generality and power, so. Uh, there's this entire spectrum, right, all the way from really high level paradigm, you know, functional, object oriented, or patterns, um, all the way down to frameworks and applications. Um, and what we normally think of as languages, we can construct our own little mini languages. That is normally what we think of as a DSL or how we're going to use the term in this in this section. Um, as a counter example, right, even if we have you know, what a lot of people would call, call you know, uh, it's a DSL, you know, we have this you know, squiggly line syntax, this is all valid elixir, right? This uh, isn't in our definition, working definition here for a DSL. This is just regular elixir, right? These are just functions talking to each other. Yes, there's some language-like things to that, but really this, this fundamentally is uh, elixir. We're not doing anything language-like with it. This is a DSL. This is a language for constructing um, uh, some in product types. So for doing um, uh, structs and variants. So uh, sums we, we don't actually have uh, in Elixir at all until we put them in LG. Um, and what it gives you, uh, the, the canonical example, right, is if you want to express the state of a, uh, uh, of a traffic light, you have red, yellow, green. Um, and I want to say, well, my state is going to be one of these three, not all of them. Uh, you know, it's an or, one, one of them. Um, and that's the def sum. And then uh, we have def data, which is, uh, you know, even nestable. So you can express these large nested structures. Um, on the right here, we have, uh, you know, maybe a player character in a video game and expressing um, instead of in with def struct, um, def data gives us, um, yes, all the fields, uh, we can put in default values, uh, generate type specs, all of this stuff, right, using this DSL, as well as sums and mix and match them together and sort of snap them together. Okay. So uh, what are some business languages um, that we need to use um, for our business logic? Well, what can we learn from? COBOL, right? You know, business language or, or uh, um, business logic. Well, we're going to use common business language, obviously, right? Um, for those who've only heard the name but, but don't know what COBOL is, it's um, a language that's uh, very widely used in, you know, for example, banking, you know, the systems that have been around for a while. Um, that uh, is, uh, if you can write it, oh, wow, it's, uh, it, uh, uh, if you can write it and you enjoy writing it, it's, it's good work to get if you can, uh, if you can. Uh, it pays extremely well because these large systems um, uh, really depend on it. And there's very, you know, vanishingly few people left that actually write COBOL. Um, it looks a lot like this, right? Um, where the idea is to make it read more like 
um, like English, right? So the idea was, well, what if we have people, you know, business people actually be able to read the logic as well with, with mixed, mixed success. So, you know, move space to WS user, WS full name, right? All this kind of, kind of reads like, uh, uh, like, you know, reads like a story, which is actually something that we want, you know, in, in a lot of code. Um, so as a story, things that we know from COBOL, um, I was at a, um, in about 2017, um, at a security token issuance company, which is to say stocks and bonds on the blockchain um, and doing cross-border uh, stocks, right? Um, so fully, fully regulated uh, and no one wanted to go to jail. So they hired me to come and write a programming language um, that would be um, readable by lawyers, so non-developers, um, be formally verifiable, and have static analysis, right? Including the compiler. Um, and we came up with what I like to call the unholy union of COBOL and Prolog. Uh, it looked, um, this is a slight simplification, but um, it really looks basically like this, where we can say things like, hey, this conforms to the following rules, the DC Security Commission rules, uh, the US STC and the Korea exchange rules. And if the following code doesn't match these things, then fail at compile time. Nobody goes to jail, a lawyer can read this, right? Uh, I've heard from people who've given um, uh, business teams, like they've written a little DSL like this, right? Uh, and given business teams the ability to configure an application, not in a WYSIWYG, you know, uh, um, uh, admin panel, but literally in code, because it's more powerful, it makes it easier for the devs to ship things so they don't have to worry about the UI layer. And really, if you have a simple enough and a clear enough language, it actually empowers the non-developers, because they have, you know, a little bit uh, of this. So I think as time goes on, we're going to see this real blurring. Programming is the most powerful concept, the most powerful tool. Computer is the most powerful tool that we've ever built. Um, and we need to find ways to bring more people into it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in text, but the uh, ability to compose new ideas, not just a panel, actually new ideas, new combinations is extremely powerful. The uh, upside of all of this, right, is this is really great for communicating with domain experts um, who um, uh, know more about, like, I'm not a lawyer, right, you know, but we wrote this thing with them that they could read. Fabulous. Um, we know how DSLs work, right? They, they form in algebra, they, they can be pulled apart, put back together really easily. We can make them correct by construction. So it's literally impossible to, to break unless you make, you know, a syntax error, which will get caught at compile time. Um, we can check for all kinds of properties that can pop time or runtime, and uh, we can make it, uh, this fits really well with domain driven design. But we have a problem, and some flexibility. Um, so shallow embeddings, this is the quick and dirty way um, that, you, that you normally see, right? So this is just using the built-in AST, and what we can represent is, uh, is a little bit limited. So this is that same, um, uh, uh, you know, part of the standard library in uh, LG. Uh, here's a binary search tree, right? So we have two options this sum, right? We can have an empty node or we can have a, um, uh, some data and a left and a right branch. Um, here's how that looks, you know, when we actually type it out and you know, create a tree. Um, and that immediately gets turned into a data structure um, and used directly, right? So there, there's actually no level in between here. It's just, we're literally just writing um, uh, Elixir, uh, in, in this specialized model, right? Ecto, LG, all of that works in there. A deep embedding um, is, I like to call it sometimes better AST, right? Or a more specific one, it's three steps. Build a game plan, transform your data, or you know, transform this game plan and then tear it down, actually run it, interpret it. Right, and so we, we have this, this nice loop, we have this cycle. Um, and then you can also do more cycles on top of that. So that data flow that I showed earlier, right, where we had this diagram and it was moving from left to right and, you know, splitting and, and joining again, we can represent purely as data, um, as a data structure, right? And now if we want to, for example, test this, it's really, really simple, right? We look at the data structure. We don't have to run it. We can just say, well, you know, the result of my syntax, is it what I expect it to be? Yes. And I can just look at it statically. Right, it doesn't have to be. Well, what's the output? Literally, here's what will get executed. We can clean up the syntax a little bit, make it a little bit more friendly. These are equivalents, so that you're not looking at this deeply nested data structure, right? So this will then build up that. But the the fundamental thing that we're working with is this view, not this view, right? 
we have our own specialized AST that's really specific to our, the problem at hand. Um, it is more work to write. You have this extra layer in between, right? But it's way more powerful and flexible. You can hand it off to different interpreters and we'll look at that in a second. You get to control the precise vocabulary of what you need. So we're not working in a turn complete language with you know anything could possibly happen and side effects and all this other stuff, right? We're saying no, it's like it's just in our case data flow, nothing else. <clears throat> um, it's much simpler to debug than a running function because you can just look at it, literally print it out. You know, here's the game plan that we're going to be executing. You can do things like time travel debugging by stopping after every step and seeing, oh. That, that was the state there, really easy. And you're not locked into one canonical implementation. So if you run a, uh, a protocol um, and you, you know, do it for integers or for numbers, then that is the only way that that can get interpreted, right? For lists, that's the only way that that can get interpreted. And with this approach, you can pass it to any other function, higher order functions, and have it tear down that structure and interpret it in a, a new unique way at compile time or at runtime. So here's a, um, you know, here's with, uh, you know, using that video game analogy, again, uh, that was hinted at before. Uh, we have a few different things happening here, right? We have movement, and we go north, we have waiting, we have stuff happening in the console. So we're gonna set caps and, you know, do some printing. Um, we have an NPC concept, who's this you know, dog that's gonna, <clears throat> you know, presumably walk around and, and do these things. Um, and we express that, you know, that gets baked down either into a straight line program. So just to say, these are the things that are going to happen in sequence, then maybe we'll loop. <clears throat> or we can do something more complex um, with our custom AST and say, you know, there's going to be branching points and, and decision uh, along the way as well. <clears throat> so uh, we can make this feel a lot like Gen Server, saying that as we're tearing down the structure, as we're going through, we're going to handle things that are text-like with handle text, and that can handle, you know, it'll look at struct this as print or set link or, you know, all these different things and replace them with, um, uh, uh, with actual functions that we're going to have it run. Different in production than in tests, right? Maybe in tests, I don't want it to actually start blinking text. I want it to log out, and now I'm, I, I did some blinking text, right? I notice the bottom line there is I can't match anything, so I'm just going to return back to you what I have. And now we have also the gameplay stuff, right? Buy item, apply power up, and handle movement. And they're decomposed. They don't have to live in one giant tree. They can be in totally separate modules. They can be in different packages. And you can compose them together just with a pipe. And we're going to run down each of these as we're interpreting that data structure and actually run some functions. Okay. <clears throat> We have this one extra line here at the bottom, right? Um, that is now how to actually interpret it, right? So we're actually gonna map the interpreter over this and then run it. So we can get just the data structure and then we can uh, separately turn it into functions. So more flexible than protocols, really easy and simple to think about, just not baked into the language, right? Protocols require things to be canonical. There's this one way of doing things, uh, this one implementation for lists. Um, libraries of well-defined mini languages, these DSLs, uh, even without the interpreter, have the developer, not the language writer, uh, not the library writer, uh, provide the interpreter. And uh, you can do things like different tests, uh, different implementations, different backends for this, right? In tests or in prod, which makes it trivial to mock. You don't even have to worry about um, uh, running the computation at all, right? You can just look at, at the, the plan. So to wrap up, let's make some new mistakes, right? Um, uh, here's five problems for the next 30 years of the beam. Hopefully uh, some of these sooner than 30 years, right? But we're about 35 years since um, since started uh, in the 80s. Let's, let's get into some new trouble uh, for the next couple decades. And the five things that uh, I think we should focus on. One, WASM, right? Client and edge beam. If we want to continue to be relevant, and we can always be relevant in the actual network switches, right, and, and, and whatnot, but uh, there is a strong move to WASM and WASI uh, serverless functions, and we need to have some sort of story uh, about those. Um, we need to lower the barrier to entry to code. So low code, no code, um, which is still code, right? Um, uh, to bring everybody else along with us, right? Everybody will be a programmer in the future, right? 30 years from now, everybody will have some exposure to this. We need better correctness tools. 
um, the fact that there's data breaches and, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, b b both from individual applications and all the way up to, you know, really, really scary things like, you know, flight control systems and everything in between. Uh, we have the tools. We need to just apply them. We need better static and dynamic analysis tools, formal methods. Uh, we need to put more time into things like Dialyzer and get them even more mature. Um, automatic parallel eval evaluation dynamically. Humans are really bad at this. Machines are really good at detecting these things. Um, so let's hand this off to the machine. We're doing things really granular granularly right now in uh, uh, on the beam and mobile agents. So today we move data to compute and do some computation over there and keep the, uh, the results. Um, being able to suspend computation partway through and ship it around on the internet or just say, hey, I want that function and I'm gonna run it locally here. Um, and I'm even gonna provide you a proof that it, that it was done correctly, which is a thing we can uh, do now called SNARKs. Um, mobile agents are gonna be extremely important, not in 2022, but sort of in 2025 and onwards as, as uh, that becomes more, uh, more mature. So we need to have some story for moving literally suspended computation around, which works really well with that uh, deep embedded uh, DSL that I mentioned before. And a final parting thoughts, Again, from the epigrams, epigram 101, dealing with failure is easy, work hard to improve. Dealing with success is also easy, you've solved the wrong problem. So let's work hard to improve. Thank you. Thanks, Brooklyn. That was awesome. I know we slightly overshot, but I, you know, I didn't want to interrupt your flow. I think you did a great job. Uh, thank you so much for uh, kind of stitching all these things. And I'm Glad you talked a bit about APL and some of the other stuff uh, because that I'm sure people in the audience would be excited. Uh, there is a growing APL community here. So thanks for doing that.